narrative is funded by viewers like you. Support our independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative. What we're talking about is, is, is he under the influence of Russia, where he's more loyal to the Russian state than he is to the American state? I mean, that's really, I mean, regardless of what term he might use, that's the question we're trying to get to. Well, and, do and you he, have a choice or it, would he even have a choice? Yeah. I think it's more that. It's less about loyalty, but to, to, did the KGB know what it was doing well enough to get this guy squeezed to the degree to where he had no choice? And Yuri can answer that for us. Yeah. Where was the KGB really good at what it did? That's the question really we're asking. Did yep. they know what they were doing or did they not? Um, you, you know, you're, and then is it possible that for nearly 30 years, he was an unwitting idiot? I, that, that makes no sense to me. I can't. It depends. Basically, on Tuesday, on uh, most important thing, what was the major basis for his recruitment or his bringing into confidential cooperation? Uh, as I explained, there are three of them. This is money, ego, or uh, psychological foundation and ideological. I strongly believe that even though there was a combination of different factors, he was recruited on money. And this is where his loyalty has been. The KGB has established. This is his loyalty. And they worked on this. They picked up on this and developed. And uh, it was successful. I believe that the most uh, successful phase of cooperation with him before he became elected as president of the United States. It was in the years 2000 when his whole campaign uh, company turned into money laundering machine for individuals, organizations, ultimately controlled by the Russian intelligence community and money laundering, well, secret, secret taking out huge amount of money out of Russian laundering list, uh, the money, it was the top priority of Russian intelligence community. And therefore, he was a top priority asset for Russians. And there were, uh, there were no. 1,300 Trump condos uh, went through the, uh, predicates of money laundering, that is all cash transactions that were anonymous. And you can make that mistake accidentally two or three or five or eight times, but 1,300 times, I think I like that's it. a pattern. And, and Deutsche yeah, Bank, well, Craig? What? I was going to say Deutsche <laughs> Bank, but go ahead, Yuri. Yeah. Well, well, you have to understand that lots of information which we collected with Craig is not in the book because mm -hmm. the, the book would be uh, several volumes. Uh, we have several volumes. Uh, I will just mention one fact. Uh, one of the organizations which was loaning money to Trump, Trump organization was um, an organized crime group in the former Soviet Union, which was exporting underage prostitutes uh, from the former Soviet Union, from Russia and Ukraine, delivering them to different bordels around the world and it was part of the huge ring which was laundering also money of colombian drug cartels and proceeds of all this huge operation was laundered through one of uh, trump tower projects and ultimately all this criminal organization was under ultimately under control of the of the fsb so it was huge. The scope of this is just just fantastic. You know, if you want to shoot a series, you will have 12. 12 series wouldn't be enough because each of these operations deserves a separate movie, you know? Yeah. He, he would have been aware of, of how the, he would have been aware of where the Craig money came and, from. Craig and Luke can attest to I've been trying to make that happen for four years. Um, but, you know, but would he have known, would Trump have known it. where this money came from? Well, again, this is this is the question because, well, you're asking, uh, was he an agent? Uh, some people look at saying that he was a uh, trusted contact. The difference is in one little thing, whether you realized 
clearly realize that you are working for foreign intelligence or, uh, service, or you were duped, you didn't realize. And in each situation, every situation, unless you are caught red-handed with a document from you stole from the CIA, it's that top secret. You no, know, you if you if you are not red-handed with it, you can always say. I didn't realize this. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Yeah, know this. in, in, in the United States, to be a useful idiot. So the difference between these two, uh, two categories is either you are a useful idiot or you are a full-fledged agent. In in but, legal you know, terms, okay, yes, excuse me. We are we are, yeah, yeah. we are kind of forgetting to mention this. The mere fact that the KGB brought Trump to Moscow in '87 under pretext of. Uh, discussing building Trump Tower in Moscow was so silly, was so stupid that, yeah. you know, you have to be an absolute idiot to buy this from Russians and to go there to seriously discuss this project because in 87, chances to even to seriously discuss this project with Russia was zero, ground zero. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and the hammer monument to capitalism. Go ahead, Craig. On Red yeah. Square is just uh, in the middle of the Cold War. It's just ridiculous. Um, yeah. there, there's another thing I wanted to raise that Albi had touched on, and I think there's a tie between uh, how he acted as a confidential informant with the FBI and his relationship with the KGB. And in both cases, it's... Uh, a uh, trusted unofficial contact of some sort. And in, in the FBI, he was known as, he was called a vest pocket source, a vest pocket contact. And that meant he was not official. He was not in the files as a CI, but he basically acted as if he were. And he began giving lots of money to James Kallstrom, who was head of the New York office back in That's the cool. 70s and befriended him again and again and again. And that afforded him a lot of protection from the FBI. Yeah, this is, this is what it was. And uh, the, the, we got invaded by, in, by our underworld. When, you know, Yuri, I, I so want to talk to you about Bob Levinson. Um, but, you know, Bob, did, Bob had some of the, and I grabbed some of these clips and I would tweet them so that people could hear it in Bob's voice. He had some of the best things to say about, look, the, this, these guys are rolling in, right? And this was in late 90s. Bob's trying to tell us, tell the world this, when it had already been a decade at least past the time that they had rolled in and, and just sort of warned the West that these Russian gangsters are coming. Are they also connected to intelligence services? Are they intelligence officers? Yes. Do they have a more dangerous agenda? Yes. But also, their gangsters are coming into our underworld. They're partnering with our gangsters. They're partnering with our crime families. And when you infiltrate through crime families as powerful as, as the Genovese and the Lucchese and the uh, Columbus and the, and the entire Cosa Nostra, as well as the outfit, right, which was still very operational and Roy Cohn was hooked into that as much as he was with the Gambinos and the Genovese. When you're, when, if you have malintent and you're coming over and you're connected to a foreign intelligence service and you're coming in to roll those guys and you successfully roll those fuckers up, you are the most dangerous people on the planet. You are people who are doing things like trafficking women, tra the global rape trade, trafficking arms, trafficking narcotics on a level that could actually swamp out our own crime families who at that point in time in the 70s, in the 80s, were the most powerful syndicates in the world. So this is what happened, everybody. We got invaded from our underworld up. That's what it was. And the characters who were in there, the property of the Genovese crime family, as well as the Gambinos around that concrete cartel, the number one jewel, one of the big jewels in the crowns in terms of the business fronts and the property was the Trump organization. It was Fred Trump before Donald, and then it was Donald. Okay? So they just took him. He was an asset. They rolled up our crime families and they took everything they could. And our crime families didn't know what fucking hit them. They did it. I've talked to some of those men, <laughs> the ones that are still alive. It, it was brutal. 
it can was I, brutal. Can I add that it was fast. also an information attack? I mean, at the same time as you're talking about being invaded by our underworld, you know, Russia did have this incredible information assault. The um, military parades that I used to watch when I was in Moscow and Red Square, I'm sure Yuri saw them as well, with these Topol intercontinental, um, you know, missiles be being wheeled over, costing, you know, tens of millions of dollars, uh, at tanks, hardware, and so on. It's all a bit last century. And then what was actually happening in, in 2016, which was a, a bunch of young or youngish sort of cynical military intelligence officers with some technical skills, um, really upending American de democracy at a, at a cost of about three hundred thousand dollars. You know that 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 was that was it. Um, and the idea that information warfare, um, that the sort of battle for for psychology, for for a mucking messing with the heads of American voters, that that's where it, where it was at. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of talk about hybrid war and all the rest of it. And I, I, I do actually think that what Putin has done, and I'd be interested to know what Yuri thinks about this, is to sort of take the Soviet playbook of disruption, of exploiting enemy weakness and division and fracture in America and in my country and so on. Um, he, he sort of updated that for, for our kind of shiny um, internet age. Um, and so we've got old school assassinations, which I write about in Shadow State, Novichok poisoning of Sergei Skripal in, in Salisbury in provincial England, and, and obviously the, the Novichok um, attack on Alexei Navalny last, la, last summer. So we've got all those kind of diversionary operations, but we've also got a kind of technical edge as well. Um, and in, in some respects, actually, Russia is, is a sort of failing state. I mean, living standards are declining. That's one of the reasons that people are protesting. There's, there's, the health service is a mess. Um, you know, the coronavirus pandemic is pretty, pretty awful and, uh, and pretty rampant. But, but as a spy state, despite missteps, Russia still um, functions and will continue to function over the next four years. And, and this is going to be a big challenge to the Biden administration is what do they do? How do they contain this sulky, aggressive, permanently hostile power, which still, Trump or no Trump, wishes America ill? Jury, jump in there. Is this a question for me? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, there is a so-called uh, Munich Conference on Security in Europe. There was this is economic forum in Europe, and Munich is the top number one. And each year they issue a report, annual report about conditions in different countries. Last year, I believe it was in November, they issued a report. The right section was called, was under title. Putemkin land. This is how they named Russia. And I was elated by this. For me, it showed that finally, after 20 years of misunderstanding what Putin's regime is, in Europe at least, they realized what is it. When we're talking about Putin, Putin's regime, we have two Russia. One Russia is real. This is what we just described with economy in free fall, with uh, people, uh, millions of people living under the level, level of uh, misery. Um, they have no chances for future because the, the science is ruined, education is poor. And on the other hand, if you watch uh, Russian television, it's another Russia. This is Russia which kicks some butts, you know, in Europe, even to the United States. You know, it's number one. All NATO, you know, United States don't know what to do with Putin. Putin rules the world. So this is a big difference between real Russia and virtual Russia. And it was created by, uh, by uh, active measures. So Putin, this is his, what he, he has done, biggest results of his regime. He brought act, uh, active measure to a new level where not just a village like Potemkin village, we all know what is it. He turned the entire country into Potemkin village. He himself became, became Potemkin because, you know, he's a miserable guy, actually. As I told you on previous uh, show, he was Mr. Nobody until he was appointed, appointed, uh, appointed successor to Yeltsin. His nickname 
was pale moth at the KGB or cigarette butt. He was a cigarette. provincial KGB guy, provincial KGB guy, and this is a special segment. You know, in the West, sometimes they say, say oh, he is a KGB. Come on, KGB, what is it, KGB? <laughs> In the United States, you have 17 agencies making U.S. intelligence community. Take out one, Defense Intelligence Agency. This is the GAU in Russia. The rest, this is the KGB. And they're all different. One is, you know, counterintelligence, FBI, and other is intelligent. People are different, mentality is different, modus operandi is different. Putin never worked there. He worked in the provinces. They never did anything. They didn't know what active measures are. But to his advantage, I had to recognize that somehow he mobilized intellectual opportunity of, of what had been left from the KGB, which basically fell apart in 91, 92, etc. And he used it to build this virtual world where he is the king, but the king is naked. And this is the truth. Yeah. And now, the, 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 king, the king is naked, but Yuri, the king is also very rich. And, and I mean, I completely agree with oh, you that yeah. the Pachomkin yeah, yeah. project, yeah. the sort of noisy nationalist, you know, make Russia great again project, that, yeah. that's the sort of front of shop. But around the back of shop, you know, Putin and his friends have been stealing like crazy for, for two decades. I mean, they really are the richest people on the planet um, yeah. collectively. I mean, they're worth many, many billions of, 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 of dollars. And actually, ultimately, I'm not sure they are great uh, patriots or, or hyper-nationalists. I, I think they're, they're nihilists, they're, they're cynics. They believe that anybody can be bored. Uh, and the, prob the problem is that they, they find so many Western politicians who, who prove this, this, this view correct with, with Trump the very top of the, of, of the list as, as a kind of an amoral mark who, who, who they could kind of hire um, and who, who really, to my mind, was fearful for four years of, 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 of Vladimir Putin. And um, even now, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, did I miss Donald Trump criticizing Putin over anything? Not um, once, not once. I don't think not I once. did, did I? Which brings us back to oh. the question that, you know, LB was asking earlier on, and you didn't land the second time for, for, for Craig, is, is Trump an asset? He's definitely an asset. The question to me is, uh, is he, how knowing is he? And I believe that, uh, again, going back to the money laundering, you don't make the same mistake, same highly profitable mistake 1,300 times in a row without knowing what you're doing. Right. There, there's a doctrine in the law called uh, 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 deliberate blindness or willful ignorance. And it's you, you, set, you, know, you sort of knowingly, intentionally don't know what can... Uh, be used against you in court. So I, I think he was really operating under that kind of constraint. He had to know, I mean, if you just, you know, even things like he wrote that one letter to Putin in which he said, I can't wait to see, he signed a PS, I can't wait to see all these beautiful women in yes. Moscow. Yeah. Something had to be going on there more. That's a very unusual way to sign a letter to uh, the president of the main yeah. country. Yeah, and let's so. not forget that if we just want to look at it again, I put my organized crime goggles on. You guys can, to me, there's a there are things that intelligence services and organized crime families do that are identical. And with Trump, you know, I don't know how many times that the syndicate that he was laundering for busted him out. You know what a bust out is, where you just you know, the intentionally bankrupt somebody so that then they have, you know, and then all the goods go out the back of the store and then they they start over, but they have nothing, you know, the property, if not just the property gets torched and burned down or it changes ownership hands to belong to somebody else now. And then comes the front man again. And he's like, oh, la, 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 la. So this guy financially, the, those bankruptcies are really important. Um, what, what happened with him financially and the squeezes he got into, what happened with the, with the banks, how he could only turn to Deutsche Bank. This is all really, really important because he was getting bankrupted by the very people who he was facilitating. Mm. Um, and that is, that, that is a syndicate move. That's a mob boss move. They've they, they done it for a century. Um, our, our gangsters did that regularly. I can't imagine that the Russian gangsters that he's laundering for didn't know how to do that as well. So they were squeezing him into this somebody. position? You squeeze them. You right. squeeze them. 
and then you break up whatever, you know, break up the, you know, all the money laundering, then you've got them. Get them in crimes, you know, crime syndicates do that as well, okay? They target a politician, they target a businessman to be their front, and they hopefully can get them into some kind of crime. But if you can get them financially, you can own them financially. That's the, that's, that's everything. Yeah. That's everything. Then well, you almost make me feel sorry for him, but I, I don't think I'm going there. No. <laughs> just, just <laughs> I'm not there. $400 million dollars that his dad left him. Right. Right? And, that he, and half of that he, he took. But I think, I think Roy was still controlling a lot of that money. Um, I do. But so I, we have to then. wrap up because we're sort of running out of time. But I just wanted to give everyone a, a shot to, to, to wrap up uh, the show. With I guess the question is, uh, do we think that the protests are going to have any impact on uh, on Putin, like, do we think that the, these protests for Navalny will they result in anything? Let's start with you, Luke. Sorry, I was, I was just saying that that I think that the Kremlin strategy is pretty clear that they're going to tough these protests out. Um, Navalny will stay in prison uh, for for the foreseeable future, and I, I think that they, they 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 calculate that they'll be able to actually um, put the lid back on this as they have done in the past. And what's interesting this time, um, what my friends in Moscow are telling me is that the, the protests are broader. They have, it's not just the kind of middle classes or the young kind of beautiful people. It's, it's a far bigger pool. Uh, but also quite interestingly in the provinces and sort of smaller towns and cities, there are more demonstrators than police. So the police are not actually able to kind of arrest everybody. So I, I think we're going to see really a, a, a period of turmoil. Um, but as, as you and I were kind of agreeing before. I, I, I don't see. I don't see the, the regime keeling over um, anytime soon. But 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 I think things are things are boiling. And the one thing we know about Russia is that it's it's a it's a hugely unpredictable place, and everything seems it's going to be there forever. And then suddenly there's 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 great change and upheaval, and that 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 may 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 happen, but probably not next week. Right, Craig. What do you think? Well, I, I guess I would wonder under those circumstances if uh, Navalny becomes a Mandela-like figure and that raises tensions there. Plus, at the same time, uh, with Biden there, I think you may have stronger sanctions and that, that would ratchet up the, uh, the pressure on Putin. And who knows when that will start to boil over. Yuri? Well, I believe that, um, unfortunately, Navalny will be staying in jail as long as Putin stays in the Kremlin. And um, <clears throat> the prospects for any changes, from my point of view, are pretty, pretty gloomy. Uh, Putin will step down, depending on the state of his health, but his successors will be there if it's been Patrushev, or even worse. So, the... Western countries, United States, Britain, other NATO countries, they should prepare for the worst. And I strongly believe the only way to deal with Putin or Patrushev regime, the only thing they understand is the position of talk, talking from position of strength. Mm -hmm. They need to see this iron fist in front of their nose and understand that uh, there is no place for, for, for jokes. Um, that's about it. All right. And LB, I've got so many other questions, I can't believe we have to end. But uh, go ahead, LB, go tell us what you think about whether these protests are going to succeed or not. I, I really don't. I, I really have no, nothing that would, uh, that would trump any of these gentlemen or, or, to, or to weigh in any differently. I, I guess the only thing I would add is, again, coming back to, you know, we've, when the Soviet Union fell, it did look like, it for for I, I'm just going to only talk about this as an American citizen. Mm. From here, it, there was an incredible amount of orchestration at the end of that to make it seem like, and now it's over, and oh, okay, we're moving on. When in fact, it had it had been a very long, multi-pronged effort um, involving wars, involving money, involving intelligence operations to actually to get. To, to get to that place that made, that where uh, our president could stand up and just make a big cinematic moment and everyone thought, oh, there was our cinematic moment. Something new is happening now. Um, so I don't know where we are at in this with, mm. with Putin. Um, I can't imagine there aren't tremendous amount of state, other state forces with us and our allies working in ways that we can't see to, to you know, cause something that can 
give a cinematic moment or a Mandela moment in the end. Mm -hmm. um, the problem that we have is that for four years, up to leading up to this, we had this horrible asset, this national security threat to us and to democracies worldwide of the presidency that was in. And that uh, investigating that, I think, helps everybody, even Russia. Right. Uh, so that's that's. But there is a sense know, around the world sense. that you know Putin is 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 a threat to most liberal democracies, no matter where yeah. where you are, and that he'll continue to do that. I assume the his successors will do that if they come out of the FSB. But you know, let's hope that maybe one day we could have a, a Mandela moment, like a, a Navalny uh, taking on leadership in that country, It'd be a, a remarkable thing for a for a country where a lot of people have suffered for many many years under just totalitarian regime after totalitarian regime. And, you said uh, last time that it's not really possible to have. Um, these long-term operations, these operations that go, you know, over 40 years or something like that. You believe that most operations happen, you know, maybe two or three steps ahead of them. It, there seems to be, as, as LB was talking there about this, you know, the, at the end of the Soviet Union into where we are now, but also the connections between Maxwell and, and Epstein, which you, were, you wrote about in your book, uh, Craig, you know, there seems to be connectivity that seems to go over many, many decades between all these all these uh, operations or or these mini operations. Is is were they were they big forty year operations? Are they? Is there someone in in the Kremlin who's actually thinking ahead for eighty years and saying, "I'm going to you know, we'll think about how the Soviet Union ends, and then we'll we'll you know Epstein will give Maxwell his money, or Maxwell will give Epstein his money." Like, how does that how does that happen? Uh, no way. They were not planning that, that far, even in the economy. They mm -hmm. had a five-year plan, that's it. So the planning in our agency was maximum one year ahead, mm -hmm. and then another year, etc., etc. Uh, another issue was confidentiality or compartmentalization of information. People who were running Maxwell had no idea what was happening in another department who was running Trump. So there was no way somehow to coordinate this operation. And from my personal experience, I drew a conclusion that if you have, if you're just one, if you are alone on a human intelligence operation, you have, let's say, 40, 80% chances for success. If you have two operatives on the same operation, it goes down to 40 percent <laughs> chances for success. If two departments are involved, again, it doubles down right. the chances for success. If two different uh, directorates, such as number one intelligence and number two counterintelligence, CIA, FBI, if they start cooperating on something, 99% that it will be a disaster, you know. So, it's so like Trump casino. It may look like they have <laughs> this failing upwards. general strategy. Their general strategy was clear what we have to do. Uh, so they pursued general strategy and it somehow fit into the general but you had, picture. But you had protocols that were effective and were used. Yeah, the protocols, yes. The protocols. So and, the, and one, thing you, you, yes. one thing you told me when we, when we were interviews, he said, he grew to completely disillusioned with the KGB and was laughing at them and at how bumbling and comical they were. And he said, look, by the end of when I'm talk through talking with you, you won't believe that these bumbling idiots did this great <laughs> intelligence coup. Right. But they did somehow do it. And I mean, here we are with but Donald you know, Trump. If you have 12,000 people in the field working towards the same goal, sometimes it will happen, you know, just by chance. <laughs> Well, they certainly lucked was, out this it time. It was a fluke. It was a fluke for them. The two books that you've got to buy are Craig Unger's American Compromise and uh, Luke Harding's Shadow State. Both are amazing. Both are really great reads. Make sure you pick them up. Uh, order them tonight. Uh, if you love the stuff, and I know this audience really does love the stuff, um, please pick these books up, read them, and, uh, and make sure that these guys come back on our show next time. So, uh, again, thanks very much to Luke and to Craig and to Yuri. It's been great having you here on the show tonight. Narrative is funded by viewers like you. Support our independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative.